Hey everybody, thanks for joining us this Thursday evening. Uh, I'm in the Northeast and it was a gorgeous day today. So I hope wherever you are, it is gorgeous. I know there's some uh, terrible weather and fires everywhere. So uh, I hope that everybody is safe. Uh, but moving on to this evening, we're gonna talk about rehabilitation of the canine forelimb. Uh, we're going to review some common rehab modalities, uh, learn about some therapeutic exercises, and rehab methods for common canine front limb issues, uh, which are a whole host of, uh, of them, as we know, uh, being in practice long enough. So lesion localization, um, well, for me, uh, since I grew up as an internist, was always really tricky, spending most of my career fixing uh, liver and GI issues. Um, however, they still pose a challenge uh, to many of us as dogs, uh, they can have referred pain. And sometimes uh, improper or too much restraint can restrict uh, the joints that we're actually trying to figure out proper range of motion. Uh, a lot of dogs are anxious, uh, there's a, um, you know, the elbow is one of the most complicated uh, three bone joints that there is, and uh, it's uh, uh, sometimes difficult to figure out what's going on there. And then most injuries are soft tissue, so radiographs um, are within normal limits. So what else can we do besides our very thorough physical exam? Uh, growing up at the Animal Medical Center, I had... Um, access to orthopedics and neurology, et cetera. And now on my own, um, I still rely on a good physical exam. And going through uh, the, uh, I took acupuncture and uh, learned from that, that if you really want to become amazing with anatomy and what is right and wrong, uh, take uh, chiropractic, because that is fully based on proper anatomy. But other advanced diagnostics that we can do would be gait analysis systems. Uh, if you don't have the money, uh, the location, uh, et cetera, there's always using um, baby powder down a driveway or paper just to get gait and figure out what's going on. Uh, arthrocentesis, arthroscopy uh, units, uh, rehab and specialty units have CT and MRI. And then thermography has been one of the newer comers uh, to help discern what is going on in some of these anatomical locations. So it sometimes is uh, really helpful to obtain a history, although how many of us have been in the exam room when the husband and wife completely disagree on what's going on, which leg, how long, um, et cetera. And now being curbside, uh, the practice that I work, uh, most of my technicians are running back and forth uh, to talk to the owner. And I find with a lameness that I uh, usually end up going outside or calling the owner um, to get much more of a detailed history. Uh, so which leg do they think it is? And they 70% of the time say it's the right front leg when it's actually the left front leg because they're facing the dog. Um, but a good question, uh, is it worse with rest or exercise? How long has it been going on? Uh, did anything make it better? And did any treatments uh, occur and did they work? So I'm gonna put up a really ugly slide. So um, I love uh, these models. I forgot where, which company they came from. It's uh, probably um, way back when Rimadil was uh, launched. Uh, but I love running around to the owners and showing this and oh my goodness, the uh, stifle joint is really awesome. Um, but moving on, uh, the shoulder um, is a ball and socket joint and the scapulothoracic articulation is completely musculature. As you know, there's no acromion, no clavicle, no labrum. The dog has less range of motion than man compared to human, or man or woman. Uh, and compared to humans, canine flexion and extension is opposite. In people, the collarbone clavicle connects the arms to the trunk and torso, and this helps us push, lift, and swing the arms. Dogs don't typically push and lift with their front limbs, lucky them. Their body's really designed for running, jumping, and turning locomotion. Um, so um, dogs lack a fully developed collarbone and instead have a small cartilaginous structure, which is softer than bone. And this design allows for enhanced speed and agility. 
The glenohumeral ligaments are the primary stabilizers and the motion is primarily flexion and extension with only some abduction. Oh, Chloe, you can't come up here, honey. My cat has discovered after a year of living with me at the ripe old age of 14 that she is in love when I sit at my computer. So hopefully she won't shut us down. Uh, mechanoreceptors and the surrounding muscles support joint stability. The biceps tendon contributes to stability passively. Abduction measurement is important, especially in agility dogs and uh, in one of the conditions that we're gonna talk about later. So we start with our, uh, after my general physical exam, uh, as an internist, I always like to start at the nose and go all the way down to the tail. Then uh, I start at the bottom of each limb and uh, work my way up looking at the toes, the nails, nail wear pattern um, underneath. And there is so much gunk that I have found uh, in between toes. I have picked out gum, sap, rocks, et cetera, from in between toes. Um, but there's a lot of weight uh, put on all these little bones. So really important to start there, work your way up. Working my way up, I flex and extend the carpus and the elbows, palpating for effusion, crepitus, instability, heat, and range of motion. Uh, continuing up to the shoulder can be tricky, uh, and I especially want to pay attention to the biceps tendon. And I remember um, being in the hallway at AMC, learning how to do a phys good orthopedic exam, and uh, Rob Parker was um, head of surgery. He has uh, he unfortunately got into a car accident a couple years later. Um, but he was trained, I think, at Florida, and uh, greyhounds uh, and greyhound racing was really popular. So he was really good at uh, biceps tendon issues. And um, so you just got to stick your fingers right inside there as you're doing uh, flexion and extension. And by golly, if you have one of these cases, um, they're an exquisite pain. So then we do the walk and the jog. Um, so we know that with a classic forelimb lameness, and we usually um, all had to suffer through equine stuff. Um, I didn't suffer, I liked it, but the small animal peeps sometimes had a little bit more difficulty, but horses made it fairly easy, uh, you know, down on sound. Head and neck are raised when the lame leg is put to the ground. So um, they throw the weight off of the lame leg. Additionally, the weight can be shifted to the hind legs so they are often, the hind legs are often carried further under the body uh, more than usual and the back may be arched because of that. Uh, the caveat to that um, when we're dealing with a hind limb lameness is a lot of times they're throwing their weight forward. So even though they are really uncomfortable, Chloe, stay away there, please. Um, even though they're lame behind, they are really, really using their shoulders to carry uh, the majority of their weight and drag themselves to get up from a sitting, laying or sitting position, et cetera. So even if I'm treating a hind limb lameness, I always go up and check the shoulders uh, to make sure that they don't need additional uh, massage, uh, ice, ultrasound, you name it. All right, so here is Puck and there's kind of a giveaway um, even though he had multiple shaved areas for catheters, you can see walking down this narrow hallway, you'll obviously know besides the fact that his leg is completely shaved, so you know um, his left front leg is the issue, he's really exacerbated and has a very prominent lameness. And then Jackie, so Really hard sometimes when these cute dogs are bouncing up and down. Sometimes all you get is four or five strides. So let me do that again. Um, so there are so many good apps today on our phones or even the video uh, component of most phones to get a front uh, video of them jogging, then a side video and you can slow it down and really slowing it down helps you very much identify um, or can help you identify where the lameness is. Uh, so after doing uh, the good physical exam and looking, uh, feeling all the bones and joints, then we want to assess um, outcome, outcome measures. And these are things that we are gonna follow throughout uh, the treatment period of these dogs. Uh, so 
at uh, functional observation. We look at joint function. We look at muscle mass. So at the top is a Gulick tape and we wind that around the muscle belly. Um, so then we can measure progress. Uh, first, actually, if there's atrophy, we compare left to right, and note that in the record. And then we can follow their progress by continuing to measure muscle mass. And then goniometer, and there's also um, an iPhone app uh, to do this as well without taking out this um, silly, probably 40 year old ruler, um, but it really helps to measure range of motion. Then we're gonna take our rehab tools and we have a lot these days, which is wonderful. Manual therapy, cryotherapy, heat, electrical stimulation, uh, PEMF, laser, therapeutic ultrasound, shockwave, treadmill, uh, both uh, wet and dry, and a swimming pool. So we will start with sort of range of motion and- This is passive range of motion. Yep, passive range of motion. Um, and it's the movement of the limb performed without a muscle contraction. So we as the practitioners or the um, examiners do the range of motion. Uh, you can also put additional pressure at the end of the range of motion uh, just to add a stretch of each joint. Passive range of motion helps prevent joint contracture and soft tissue shortening. It maintains mobility between the soft tissue layers, enhanced blood flow, lymph flow, improves synovial fluid production and diffusion. It's really important for um, whoever's doing it to maintain a range of motion that's in the patient's comfort level and not hurt the tissues more by exceeding their limits. Um, ideally, you know, and Anytime we're doing treatments, uh, passive range of motion should be performed in a quiet environment with the patient relaxed um, and in lateral recumbency. It is best if you notice she isolated each joint one at a time while keeping the others in a neutral position. Uh, movement should start slowly, progress until end point of the range of motion is reached. Gentle pressure, if you want to sort of do those manipulations, can be applied for 15 seconds at the end of flexion and extension to add stretching to the treatment. It's recommended to perform 15 to 20 repetitions two to four times a day and continue until the animal is able to voluntarily do this exercise. So because passive range of motion is performed without a muscle contraction, it's actually not considered a strengthening exercise. This is more of a feeding all the joints and tissues, keeping them supple. Um, and even for our patients in intensive care units or, um, moving out of those, uh, just sort of staying in a cage all the time. It's really important if these animals can't ambulate that they are getting attention to all their joints. So that is a good one. And uh, all it cost was your education. You don't need any special tools. Cryotherapy, uh, ice therapy decreases muscle spasm by decreasing the muscle metabolism, decreasing the um, byproducts made, which are very irritating. It will cause a peripheral muscle constriction and inhibits the inflammatory mediators. It decreases nerve conduction velocity and all of this equals pain relief. Uh, indications for use of cryotherapy include pain, swelling, edema, muscle spasm, acute inflammation, surgery, overuse, exacerbations of osteoarthritis. So when any of these patients actually come into uh, the rehab or you're gonna start uh, doing rehab at home, owners are gonna do that. Uh, at the end of, first we wanna sort of warm everything up to make it supple, but then at the end, after we've sort of uh, been working and manipulating all these joints, we wanna end with some ice therapy. All right. Um, hyperthermia, uh, the effects of absorbed heat are to decrease joint stiffness, relieve spasms, reduce swelling, and increase circulation. Heat therapy relieves pain by activating the gate control uh, mechanism and secretes endorphins to actually block pain. By raising the tissue temperature, the increased metabolism reduces oxygen tension, lowers pH, and increases capillary permeability. Uh, bradykinins and histamine are released, which also cause vasodilation. Uh, moist heat penetrates more deeply than dry heat. So if you look at this, um, this was Jerry, a German shepherd, um, that is a hydrocolating, uh, it's a, a moist heating pad uh, wrapped in a towel because it is uh, pretty warm and <clears throat> just laid on her hips because she had severe osteoarthritis. 
Um, and I think one of the things I love about doing rehab is after the initial uh, couple of visits, you know, owners, um, I'm not sure uh, the population of who is listening to this webinar, uh, but where I worked, we didn't really have owners in the um, rehab unit. And that was probably more designed for space uh, reasons. Um, but anyway, uh, the owners would always say, oh, you know, Jerry's going to be so stressed and, you know, I don't want to leave her there alone. And my goodness, these dogs really love taking a break, uh, laying on the nice cushy pad and getting some heat therapy to loosen up those joints before they started exercising. Now, probably during COVID, it again is going back to anybody who used to have a rehab unit that had uh, owners in the building. Uh, they do not anymore. Electrotherapy, um, these are electrical modalities um, used for um, patients. Uh, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, TENS, provides pain relief by stimulating cutaneous pain fibers. Um, and it's mostly through a gate control or counter irritant mechanism. So there's a large number of benign stimuli being bombarded to the skin and they compete with the painful stimuli originating in and around the, um, any joint that has an issue. Um, and I think when I had my back pain, I wore my TENS unit all the time. And it's just, even though we are so brilliant because uh, we went to vet school and we know a lot of things, the fact that this little machine, which is probably $28 on Amazon uh, can trick our pain fibers into um, not feeling the pain at that point. Neuromuscular stim is different. Uh, it's used for muscle strengthening. Um, and so we use it for, to actually get a muscle contraction. So if you have a patient, let's say they have a brachial plexus avulsion. So that limb while you're working on it is pretty completely um, uh, atrophied. You wanna use uh, neuromuscular stim to enhance muscle, to get a muscle contraction and work on muscle strengthening or at least preventing atrophy. Um, and I think the rule is for every day of disuse, it takes about three days of kind of aggressive use to sort of uh, cancel out that one day of disuse. So uh, it's a good way to also project to the owners when you're dealing with some type of front limb or any, uh, issue that you make realistic expectations to them. You know, your dog's been lame uh, and muscle wasting away for six weeks. So it's gonna take three times as long at least um, to get things back. All right. So one of my favorites, pulse electromagnetic field therapy. Um, it's misleadingly uh, and mistakenly sometimes called magnetic field therapy. Um, these are pulsing electromagnetic fields and it encompasses an immense spectrum making it almost impossible for the uninfirmed layperson and frankly a lot of veterinarians uh, to assess and differentiate among the individual um, concepts, uh, machines available on the market. Uh, there are a ton. Uh, there are a ton. Um, so PMF is a generic term like radiation. So uh, it leads us to do a lot of education of ourselves, but that's okay. I'm here to make that simple for you. So PMF is an active electromagnetic waveform delivered by antenna. So if you look at that screen, the white dongle um, has the battery, two batteries. You can see the two little round things and they actually generate the pulses and the black loops or coils are actually the antennas. Uh, so all the different technologies are differentiated by parameters of waveforms that they emit, such as the antenna size, the duration and frequency of the application, um, and these uh, combined determine strength and efficacy. So one of the things, if you look online, as soon as you, and I will tell you, do not Google PMF, please, because your Facebook and any other search engine is gonna bombard you with all these big suitcase models where you can get certified in three short weeks uh, to be a PMF um, therapist. Uh, PMF waveforms do not cause heat and they do not depolarize membranes. So there's no muscle, muscle, oh my goodness, muscle contraction at all. Um, and according to the FDA, who made a pretty um, rigorous statement at section 890.5290, PMF medical device is a prescription device 
transmitting a therapeutic signal in the radio frequency band of 13.56 or 27.2 like the ACC loop uh, for the adjunct of palliative treatment of pain and edema in soft tissue without generating heat. So for FDA approval, and there's a difference also in these terms. So when anybody has a machine that they are trying to market, they actually have to register with the FDA. That's called an FDA registration. But to actually get FDA approval and be able to say that on your website, uh, one must prove safety and then it is electromagnetically compatible with its use and then give the complete signal output characteristics such as peak output power, pulse width, pulse frequency, duty cycle, antenna output, specific absorption rates, characterization of deposited energy, electrical and magnetic fields with the correct labeling and clinical testing. So this is a pretty uh, high bar. Um, that's why a lot of PMF uh, machines are not FDA approved. And uh, kind of the way I like to simplify it, because I always get into this discussion with especially the equine market um, about their machines better because it's stronger, stronger, faster, better, blah. Um, and if you look, if they are trying to register or do anything like that, they have to actually pick a category uh, and a code for that category to do the registration. And for true pulse ele electromagnetic field therapy, ILX and PQY are the codes for non-thermal shortwave therapy. Other ones, and pretty much uh, if you can trace the paperwork between the human market, the veterinary market, and find something that was filed uh, 10 or 15 years ago, um, a lot of these other companies that you see that they put that big, huge loop around the horse's neck and it's gyrating and the horse looks like it's in love all of a sudden and you see hearts shooting out from its ears. Um, they are registering these machines with NGX, which is actually a code for a powered muscle stimulator. And that has nothing to do with PMF. So after I go through and describe all of that, um, a lot of vets say, you know, they get defensive. Well, you know, I like to use it. I put the big loop and it treats the horses back and I only need, you know, 15 or 20 minutes and I can get them to relax before going into a show ring. This is an actual conversation I had with somebody. And I said, that's great. It's a muscle massager. I mean, who wouldn't like that? But it's not PMF. So if you're going to do that muscle manipulation, go ahead and get a loop or get one of the Clinica pads, buy something that is actually true PEMF because you can make a difference in that animal's life. Um, so it works to enhance nitric oxide production. We get a lot of questions about its use in uh, cancer. Um, the nice thing about our device, since we know pretty much all the parameters, is that it is one one thousandth the strength of a cell phone. So we are all running around now, especially these days with COVID, we're communicating with our friends and family and clients on our phones. Um, if you can hold a phone up to your head for that long, you can certainly have a loop do that. And it is a downstream signaling uh, a promoter for a cyclic GMP and cyclic AMP, which leads to uh, better improved blood flow, tissue oxygenation, cell differentiation, and matrix formation. And in one of the hemilaminectomy studies that was done, it mimicked the human use, uh, the human studies showing that there were um, uh, half as much opioid use um, in the cases that use the active form of the loop. Okay. Well, I love talking about the loop, but we will move on. Oh, moving on. Okay. Laser, uh, class three and four, uh, more and more veterinary offices, not just rehab uh, specific or orthopedic specialty clinics have laser units. Uh, pretty much um, they do a really good job of marketing and I do love lasers. Uh, the physiological effects of lasers reportedly are cell division, leukocyte phagocytosis, stimulation of fibroblasts and collagen formation. Also like the loop enhanced nitric oxide, ATP synthesis and angiogenesis. So another question I get very commonly is can you use the laser in conjunction with the loop? And I would say <clears throat> you can. Uh, the issue about um, nitric oxide formation is once the body is actually uh, enhanced nitric oxide, it kind of goes on its cascade downstream signaling what it needs to do, and it doesn't come back to steady state where it can be enhanced again for at least two hours. 
So you can use both laser and the loop together, but you're not going to get any real added benefit from those aspects. Um, it's not going to hurt. So a lot of veterinary offices have a PMF mat in their office. They do their laser on it, blah, blah, blah. But definitely send them home with the loop because the loop is almost, almost idiot proof. All right. Next is therapeutic ultrasound. And this is where um, I think one of the modalities that I used almost most often uh, in front limb lamenesses and exactly in that situation right there. <clears throat> it, um, therapeutic ultrasound is an excellent modality for deep tissue heating uh, to repair soft tissues and relieve pain. Um, it has thermal and non-thermal effects depending on whether it is pulsed or not pulsed like a lot of our equipment. So another just teaching point here is that the loop, even though there is a uh, warning not to use over implants, um, that warning from the FDA is in a category above like the parent category that PMF is in and um, non-pulsed um, therapies usually tend to cause heat. And so you definitely do not wanna heat up. So you're not gonna use an ultrasound for the purpose of heating tissues if they have a plate in there because you're gonna burn the patient from the inside out. But same with the loop, since it is pulsed electromagnetic field therapy, it does not cause heat. So it is safe to use. Um, and the, one of the most, um, one of the big researchers in the 90s that used the loop uh, in laboratory and on his patients um, had a pacemaker and even wore the loop himself. Now, I don't know what he was treating, not, he don't think he put it right over his heart. Uh, in patients, if they have a pacemaker, we recommend to keep the uh, loop uh, below waist level, but um, it really is not a contraindication for the loop. Here we go. I just love loop talk. Sorry. Okay. All right. Land treadmill. Uh, on the level, land treadmill can be used to strengthen, re-educate, and build endurance. So especially in uh, like a brachial plexus avulsion case, uh, you could have the therapist stand on the side, uh, put the side of the land treadmill down, and have uh, the therapist mimic the stride of that front limb and the belt will uh, provide proprioceptive feedback to that patient. Then um, if you want to really increase the level of difficulty, um, a lot of the treadmills uh, incline or decline or you can raise the ends on um, cement bricks or whatever. So if you put that land mill uh, land treadmill facing down, then there's going to be more weight placed on those front limbs. So again, a, a walking non-concussive, you know, just a little bit more body weight uh, to help try and uh, re-educate uh, and strengthen those muscles. And then when they're uh, feeling much better, you can use the treadmill at higher speeds for conditioning. All right, underwater treadmill. Um, Using this will provide pain relief, improve circulation and make all the soft tissues more elastic. So I love this because it is um, sort of a whole body treatment. One, it warms up all the tissues. Um, two, the belt provides proprioceptive feedback. Um, this patient, we are trying to get them to use the hind limb uh, more than uh, it was using, but you can use the same adaptations to uh, do front limb strengthening to increase pro proprioception and prevent muscle atrophy and the like. Massage, and massage was always, uh, I think uh, a decade ago was, you know, poo-pooed upon like whatever, but uh, we know absolutely that various techniques, um, systematic massage can increase arterial, venous, and lymphatic flow. It can break down and prevent tissue adhesion. So again, this is where I use a lot of massage in my, in my hind limb lameness cases that the dogs are so uncomfortable up front because they're lugging around so much more weight than they're supposed to and whoever has a skinny lab anymore nobody um, so these dogs really can you can break down the um, trigger points um, etc tissue manipulation can clear edema and uh, muscle spasms which relieve soreness Shockwave therapy uh, uses pressure waves to treat musculoskeletal conditions. These are high energy 
acoustic waves delivering a mechanical force to tissues. Uh, the pressure wave rapidly increases with the period um, following of negative pressure. Energy is released at areas of high acoustic impedance. Uh, shockwave therapy started in the 1980s with lith lithotripsy. It makes sense, right? Um, there are different types, including electrohydraulic, electromagnetic, piezoelectric, and radio sh radial shockwave. Many parameters, peak energy, rise time, energy flux, penetration, delta, focal area, pulse, et cetera, beyond the scope of this lecture. Um, indications are impaired bone, tendon, healing, um, impaired bone, tendon, and ligament healing, osteoarthritis, and others. And I would say that when I was working in a, um, in a rehab clinic, um, definitely we would have to break out the shockwave unit for uh, cases of shoulder and elbow because uh, carrying more of the body weight of the animal uh, and that elbow is such an unforgiving joint, um, we usually had to uh, break out the shockwave for treatment of these cases. Therapeutic exercises are the cornerstone of rehabilitation um, and strengthening, balance, coordination, retraining, conditioning. So I love Cavaletti rails because uh, for not a lot of money, you can go to a big box store and buy uh, those orange cones and you can drill holes in different levels. And then you take um, whatever you want, broom handles, PVC pipe and lay them um, within the holes and make them at different angles. They can just be raised, they can be raised higher to have the animal step over. And, um, oh my goodness, I forgot the name of this dog. She was cute as a button. We are working on some generalized OA with her, but just look at her hock flexion. Uh, so she has to think about stepping over um, each Cavaletti rail. And this is the same exercise. I don't know if anybody is still into football. Um, I have recently started watching the New England Patriots, um, and shh, don't tell anybody, but uh, football players, when they are in training, they run through all of those. I'm sure they're not tires anymore, but the old videos are having athletes running through tires. So they really want very good coordination, proprioceptive feedback. So thinking about them running through all those tires and having to lift their feet through everything. Um, they're trying to increase the speed of conduction of the nerves from the bottom of the foot to the brain, um, et cetera. And then activity scale is really important, uh, especially for clients to log history and see improvement uh, because uh, you do all this work and they're like, oh, you know, he's really not better. He's been coming in here and they're like, wait a minute. Well, before he couldn't even hop into your car when he was coming to rehab. But now you're telling me not only is he jumping in the car, but now he's jumping on the bed and jumping off the bed, which is bad. But um, it's really good to have, uh, make sure the owners stay in check with their perspective. Um, and then at home, we like to give them a log to fill out. So we give them a home exercise program, no more than three therapeutic exercises per day. Uh, we specify how many repetitions or for how long, and then uh, record their response. Are they really tired or sore after those? And if so, then you want to back down either the amount uh, or difficulty of the exercises or the amount of repetitions, et cetera. And I think I just said that, so owner keep log, no more than three exercises, three times a day. <coughs> so how about some of the things that we are treating? One is supraspinatus tendinopathy. Uh, the supraspinatus muscle extends the shoulder and advances the limb. This muscle is important to stabilize and prevent collapse of the shoulder joint and is active during 65 to 80% of the time when the dog is standing, sort of locked in place. Uh, in humans and dogs, several degenerative disorders of the supraspinatus tendon have been identified, including rotator cuff tears, calcifying tendinitis, inflammation, tendinosis, micro tears, um, and as a result of overuse. Um, good evidence indicates that overuse is likely an important factor in uh, rotator cuff tears in humans. Um, at the cellular level, affected tendons contain discontinuous disorganized fibers, and typically um, it's hard to detect inflammation on a physical exam. In chronic cases, sometimes there's a growing nodule that can impinge on the biceps, brachii, tendon, and cause pain. 
Uh, dogs with supraspinatus tendinopathies commonly have weight-bearing lameness on one side that becomes worse with activity and is often resistant to just your general non-steroidal treatment. Um, supraspinatus muscle may be atrophied and direct palpation over the tendon and flexion of the shoulder may cause pain. And then here is just an x-ray showing mineralization uh, within the tendon which occurs in many of the chronic tendon conditions. Um, that's a great um, radiograph. MRI readily demonstrates the condition in the acute phase. Uh, plain x-rays and CAT scans may reveal mineralization in chronic cases. Uh, arthroscopic ex exploration may demonstrate impingement of the biceps tendon secretary to supraspinatus, supraspinatus tendon swelling, as well as possible shoulder instability. So uh, cause appearing to be related to repeated uh, repetitive strain injury. So that, I guess, uh, in humans, um, I think the one that I can tell most likely, even though it's not exactly, is carpal tunnel syndrome. Keep doing the same thing over and over again. Now, we can't tell these dogs to stop walking um, or stop standing, uh, which is the issue, but rest um, is uh, good, especially if they are um, agility patients. Uh, treatment consists of conservative medical management, controlled activity, non-steroidals, and rehab therapy, which is all the things that we just talked about. Cryotherapy, ultrasound, PMF, passive range of motion, and therapeutic exercises. And we definitely don't want, there's a lot of old dogs that come in, and sometimes it's really hard to visualize if they're nice fluffy dogs, um, nice fluffy golden retriever or German shepherd. Uh, but sometimes in these old patients, you really wanna palpate um, over the bony prominences in the front limb just to feel uh, if there's muscle atrophy. So one of the cool things, if you don't have a land treadmill, uh, you can just have them walk down a hill. That's cute little Finnegan who was a poster child for us in our rehab unit. Uh, non-concussive, gentle walking downhill. Then you can do three-legged standing. Three-legged standing, uh, why I love it is that it's a very good example of an isometric exercise. Uh, isometric exercises are a type of strength training in which the joint angle and muscle strength do not change during contraction compared to either a concentric or eccentric contraction. Um, isometrics are done in static positions and not done in a range of motion. So just Finnegan standing there with me holding up that hind limb. One, you want to, when you're doing this, you do not want to take the weight bearing aspect of that hind limb and transfer it through to your hand. You want the patient to actually balance through all the three other limbs uh, to keep its balance. And uh, it takes a little practice to uh, get this accomplished, but it's really fabulous, fabulous exercise for almost any patient, especially the old cripple, 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 this would be, this is very difficult for them. But the fact that it is isometric is wonderful. And we're not really challenging them to do anything that is concussive. When they graduate, where's my mouse? And graduate to paraleg standing on opposite sides. Again, you are not uh, to take the weight bearing aspect into your hands. Uh, this is also called a Snoopy. Um, and then you can also do uh, paraleg standing on the same side, uh, which also helps. And by reference, much easier if they are small dogs. Um, but there is uh, Shauna trying to get this dog to um, just place weight non-concussively on the opposite limbs. When they get super advanced, uh, using a wobble board, um, sort of consistency, and that's very wobbly. Uh, you can find ways to stabilize more, um, but there are many ways there are um, instructions online. You could Google how to make your own wobble board um, and it doesn't have to be so wobbly uh, or even a ramp to stand on, et cetera. So a lot of these cases, one of the more difficulty things is trying to encourage uh, shoulder extension and um, if we encourage play by using this rope toy, we can get this dog to reach out with its front limbs. Then, let's see if it's starting. 
Um, this is an example of the Cavaletti rails. And again, this is a dogwood hind limb issues, but as an example, by going through Cavaletti rails, it has to exercise both its front limbs and its hind limbs uh, when it gets itself out of the corner. That's a happy dog. Doesn't even know that it's exercising. But exaggerated uh, walking posture there, which is good. And then with Gusto, this is obviously the dog 10 years earlier, um, going through, going through. So he doesn't even know he's exercising back and forth, back and forth, even with nobody telling him to do it. Um, it's lovely that he is a food and reward driven dog. Now, the other thing you can do, which is actually more for hind limbs, but we actually have a couple of videos somewhere of this dog going through the Cavaletti rails backwards, uh, which is pretty advanced. All right, paw shakes, really good for elbow, uh, high five as well. Uh, so a couple things that are happening in just this simple exercise. Uh, number one is that he is, well, most dogs are sitting a little more squarely than Finnegan directly sitting on his butt cheeks. But um, so having to posture appropriately to sort of rock back a little bit. So taking some of the weight uh, from the front legs, transferring it to the rear, and then reaching up and forward and extending that leg for a shake um, is awesome. And here we have Alpha who actually had elbow OA and came in to visit us. And he is not a righty. He says, no, I want this one. Uh, dogs are hams. Uh, you get to learn uh, just like Alpha, like, you know, uh, what joint, what limb they need work on. All right, moving on. Bicipital tenosynovitis. Uh, the biceps tendon crosses the shoulder joint. The biceps flexes the elbow and extends and stabilizes the shoulder joint during standing. I got a picture of it. Um, or during the weight bearing phase of locomotion, pain and discomfort may be elicited by direct palpation over the biceps tendon. Uh, pain and spasm may be noted when flexing the shoulder while at the same time extending the elbow. And here's just a naked picture of that biceps tendon and the insertion. The biceps flexes the elbow and extends and stabilizes the shoulder during standing in the weight-bearing phase of locomotion. Dogs often will have a weight-bearing lameness, subtle to severe, on one side that becomes much worse with activity. Okay. Uh, pain and discomfort may be elicited by direct palpation um, over the biceps tendon. Pain and spasm may be noted when flexing the shoulder while at the same time extending the elbow. Uh, they may have a shortened stride and have difficulty turning to the affected side. So a lot of these um, dogs that are coming in, um, many of the most astute owners are actually the agility dogs. And so um, they will have difficulty making a tight turn um, or having a short stride uh, on the side that they are affected. And what do we do? We do conservative management, involves rest from strenuous um, activity, uh, no uh, concussive activities, ice, ultrasound, laser, PMF, uh, shockwave, and therapeutic exercises slowly added in uh, to prevent um, muscle atrophy. So this is an arthroscopic view of a sort of healthy um, biceps tendon area in there. And there's just a couple little feathers in there, but everything's really nice and pink. And then you see the one on the right with all that frayed tissue. Um, so you'd have to go in and clean up that. Uh, medial shoulder instability. I haven't treated one of these in a long time. Um, so uh, I know there are some big rehabbers out there. Um, I know via VOSM in Annapolis Junction, they, they love this um, injury uh, as chronic repetitive activity overuse leads to degeneration of tissues and tensile strength. Uh, very, very common in agility dogs. Uh, they present with a shortened stride, lameness worse after exercise, decreased range of motion, um, abduction, ABOA causes pain and spasm. So you actually have to measure the abduction. Um, and uh, that is one way using that. And this is also where one of your iPhone apps might be better to actually measure shoulder abduction angle test, um, who is uh, border collies are probably overrepresented in this uh, disease. 
and where are my words? So these are actually graded, mild, moderate, severe. Treatment may incorporate slings, hobble, surgery, et cetera. You want to get them into rehab immediately. And I think that's one of the things that really has changed in our uh, over the course of 10, 15, well, maybe not 20 years, um, that everybody saved rehab for the impossible cases, the ones that were already atrophied, the thing that nothing else worked. And now we're much more into uh, maybe initially post-operative or post-injury conservative. So passive range of motion, ice, uh, you name it. Um, and if you're going to start doing proprioceptive exercises, they should be isometric. Uh, and we also want to stay on top of the pain. So then moving on to the elbow. So the elbow is a hinge joint with interfaces between the humerus, ulna, and humerus and radius. Again, the motion is primary flexion and extension. It's very stable, but very unforgiving. Uh, the biceps are less important in canines uh, because they do very little lifting. Um, we got all of these hammered into our heads uh, going through vet school. Why do they have elbow dysplasia? Um, these are developmental abnormalities leading to malformation and degeneration of the elbow, fractured medial coronoid process, osteochondrosis dissecans, ununited anconeal process, boy, they're a mouthful. So fractured medial coronoid, abnormal biomechanical stresses to the medial coronoid process result in fragmentation and asynchronous growth of the radius and or ulna. Uh, Post-fragment removal, um, the patient should absolutely have rehab. So help, helping to stay on top of pain with ice um, and doing passive range of motion, et cetera, is really paramount. Uh, to these dogs post-operatively. OCD, um, or OC is a cartilage flap. It's best to be removed. Um, probably feels like a large pebble in your shoe, any of these fragments at all. Um, ununited ankyneal process develops as a separate center of ossification. Um, it is very common in large and giant breed dogs. Uh, surgical removal, removal is indicated. So just following whoo, what happened to the rest of my words. Okay, um, as with most other issues that we were treating just the shoulder, uh, the goal is to decrease pain and inflammation. We're gonna use cryotherapy, laser therapy, PMF, TENS. Uh, once the pain is controlled, so you get them into your unit, you start doing these modalities, they're on non-steroidals. <clears throat> you wanna do therapeutic exercise to encourage um, elbow range of motion. So one of them here is another use, God is me cute, of, um, of the Cavalettis is not going over and not going around and cheating, but definitely going under. So they have to really flex the elbow. Boy, they're smart, aren't they? Rehab, you have to have just, there you go, tincture of uh, good humor when you're treating patients. One of the other ones we know is scrunchy to the nose. So uh, this is an inexpensive, um, uh, exercise. Almost every person working in rehab or veterinary medicine, there's long-haired people around all the time. They either have a ponytail holder or a scrunchie. Scrunchies are the best. Put it around the nose and then you actually are watching them remove that scrunchie by doing elbow flexion and extension, etc. Also like hydrotherapy, um, putting it usually water level is at the level of the elbow. Uh, this is a bit high for him, but we are also treating his shoulders. And also we like to have them play with toys. So he loved playing with his rubber ducky. Uh, we'll move on quickly to a case. This is Rolo. Uh, Rolo uh, was a lab. Uh, he weighed 84 pounds. He was, um, his owner was mortified when I called him a flabrador. Uh, body condition score six out of nine, lameness three out of nine, three out of five. And this was his, so walking, seeing from the butt, not much there. Um, I, uh, but you definitely see that pronounced limp, limp up front. And uh, I don't know if this video shows it. Um, it's always, you always to get some, take laughter where it is. So he's really gimpy, right? Um, but uh, walking down the hall, the owner bonks himself on a fire hydro, uh, the fire um, extinguisher. But anyway, Rollo was a classic, um, classic lab patient. Um, he had a left elbow arthroscopy. 
uh, with a fractured medial coronoid process. He had the debride on January 20th. He had moderate to severe elbow um, OA. The owner wanted to do everything. So we had him on dasiquin, tramadol, milk thistle, fish oil, amantadine, and put him on a diet. And uh, if any of you have heard any of my other um, lectures that um, everything needs to be skinny body condition score between four and five um, and everybody will live longer and without uh, with less pain anyway. So 30 days post arthroscopy. So the nice thing is they can be their own, um, their own test case. So carpus flexion um, and extension, uh, elbow flexion, you compare left to right. Uh, normal flexion is 36 degrees and they have breed specific charts for this. Normal extension is 165 and you can see where he was off a little bit there. Uh, normal flexion in the shoulder, 57, normal extension, 165. So he's off there. And then there's two centimeters of girth muscle belly difference between the two. So we will come up with a plan for Rolo, which is going to include laser uh, to the elbow, deep tissue ultrasound to the elbow, neuromuscular stim applied to the triceps and the supraspinatus, passive range of motion, massage and stretching, and then dispense a loop for at home treatment. We wanted to use exercises, especially isometrics in the beginning to encourage weight bearing, strengthen the left front limb. We're gonna use Cavaletti rails, three-legged standing, push-ups when he's more um, adept at that hydrotherapy. And then we're gonna end because that's probably gonna irritate everything with cryotherapy to the left elbow. So Rolo was, um, he loved the air mattress exercises. So he is just balancing on an air mattress and then we can do cookie stretches to the left and the right just to encourage um, more weight bearing on that. But he's definitely rocking forward <clears throat> on those uh, front limbs, et cetera. He also was a very good model for the real cookie stretches on the ground, left to right, right to left. You can do cookies to the shoulder, cookies to the elbow, cookies to the hip, cookies to the front toes, cookies to the rear toes. Uh, cookies down below the knees, etc. Anything so they don't think that they are actually exercising is perfect. So here he is in the underwater treadmill. He's a trooper. Didn't even have to smear peanut butter on the uh, front gate um, of that, but it definitely can be helpful. All right, here we go. So our goal is to improve range of motion of the left elbow, improve weight bearing on the left front, improve muscle mass and strength, decrease discomfort. And really for him, it uh, became a quality of life issue. Uh, so we started seeing him twice a week. Uh, he did really well. And just uh, another case, which I didn't end up talking about, but I put it in here because sometimes we actually see it. Uh, this is uh, Dingo. And he actually had... Uh, or she had um, bilateral carpal arthritis um, and she also had carpus hyperextension while standing the left, uh, the right was greater than the left um, and was also exacerbated by having the osteoarthritis. So she had um, uh, reduced range of motion. So a couple exercises for Dingo. Um, Let's see if you can see her actually carpi hyperextend. Thank goodness they've made a lot of improvements in video um, these days. Um, so there's some carpal hyperextension there. And again, very important to start with uh, some measurements, uh, flexion and extension. We prescribe push ups for her, uh, scrunchy to the muzzle, passive range of motion to the carpus bilaterally, downhill walking. Um, and Cavaletti's. Uh, so we did in clinic Cavaletti times 10, sit uh, and shake the right front only times five, scrunchy to the nose four times. We did tens, passive range of motion. We stretched the carpi and metacarpals. Uh, we massaged her muscles, underwater treadmill, and she got uh, sent home with a loop. And there she is doing a shake exercise. And here she is wheelbarrowing. And my video is not playing. But you can see that the therapist has lifted up the front limbs. Um, sometimes these patients need braces and more support during their exercises. This is her walking over the Cavaletti's. Doesn't seem to be a big deal. 
love Cavalettis. Uh, our goals were pain control, increased forelimb, um, uh, and that's supposed to say carpus, sorry, range of motion, uh, conditioning and strengthening of the forelimbs and the hind limbs. So uh, Dingo did well, and, and then her owner graduated from the internship and moved far away. So we don't know what actually ended up happening to Dingo. 